be mine. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. Welcome to another episode of Equity Mates, where we will help you learn to invest in 20 minutes or less. We break down the world of investing from beginning to dividends so that you can hopefully make some returns. My name's Bryce, and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you going, bro? I'm very good, Bryce. How are you? Mate, I'm well. You're under the pump, though. I am under the pump. But you know what? I'm uh, pretty stoked that I've made you uh, change it to 20 minutes or less. Uh, my okay. next goal is to make you change it to 25 minutes or less. <laughs> there's, a, there's a hard limit at 20. But... Oh, is there? Like, you used to think that about 15, but I broke through that damn wall. Uh, I know, I know, I know. We'll talk about this at our annual general meeting. Oh, um... <laughs> When's that? Oh, we've got to decide the date at yeah, our yeah, yeah. next board meeting. G- given that we don't have any shareholders, there's probably not going to be many people at the AGM. <laughs> True. So have you found a house? Uh, no, no. So for those listening, um, I'm not trying to invest in the property market. I am um, actually just trying to find a share house uh, <laughs> with a couple of our mates. And uh, if we don't find one by Friday, I'll be homeless. Officially homeless. So if anyone's down in Melbourne and has a room to spare and is wanting to uh, take the famous Alec Renahan under, under their wing for a little bit, <laughs> shout out. <laughs> Uh no, I'll be right. We'll um we'll find something. Yeah, you you'll find something, Ren. I'll, I'll I'll back you in. Yeah, otherwise I might be sleeping in my car for a few weeks. Yeah, well, I mean, this could be the start of something big. Who knows? What sleeping in my car? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about it. Uh, if if I do, the biggest thing that will suffer is equity mates because I, I won't be able to record. I know that's a that's a real blow. So you'll have to just do solo episodes. I'm, as much as the listeners are probably crying out for that, <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> I'm not sure that that will go down too well. So, look, we'll make it work, Ren. Um, yeah, if you and... don't hear me for a couple of weeks, you'll know I'm bloody sleeping in the street in Melbourne somewhere. Yeah, or in your boot. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we've got a, a new episode format that we haven't done before on the show, Ren, and, and this is one that uh, we've been planning for a while. You, you've wanted to do this for a while, but... Just before we get into that, a couple of pieces of housekeeping, as always. Uh, if anyone has signed up to our Thought Starters email, which is the email that we send every Monday with uh, news and, and interesting articles that have piqued our attention and some articles that are tailored just for basics 101s and those guys that are just getting into the market. If you have signed up for that, but you're not getting it, please check your junk emails because there is a chance that they will be going there. So make sure that we're in your contact list. And also, Instagram is back up and running for us in a big way. So make sure you follow us. We're, we're now putting a fair bit of content uh, that is that is great to learn from and also you know uh, get you active in, in thinking about the market. So it's not just fantastic memes with dogs and that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, where, Although there might be some. There might be some, yeah. But we've now got some uh, good stuff coming through on Instagram. So follow us there, equitymates underscore investing podcast. So that's enough for housekeeping, uh, but just keep those in mind. So Come on, mate. You're rubbing it in. Housekeeping? <laughs> like, seriously. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, Sorry. mate. We just talked about how I'm going to be homeless. Come on, keep up. <laughs> well, Ren, do you want to introduce us to the title of this episode and, and what uh, the structure is going to be and, and how we're going to take this forward and then uh, we'll jump in from there? Yeah, okay. So... I don't actually know what the title is going to be. What is it going to be like? Meet the investor? Is that the? That sounds good. Yeah. All right. Done. We'll make it up on the fly. So I guess the the idea behind this was we all know Warren Buffett. Yes. Some of us know Carl Icahn and uh, you know Stan Druckenmiller, but then after that, it all falls away very quickly. You know, people just in general aren't familiar with a lot of investors, and especially Australian investors like. Before we started this podcast, I don't know if I could have named five Australian investors, and yet these are the people that are investing our super, uh, for many people investing our savings, and it's probably important that we know who some of the the best investors are in Australia. Yeah. And it's also, it's interesting, you know, they these are people with, you know, pretty good careers, 
interesting views on the market um, and are worth knowing about, worth learning from. And so as part of this podcast, we may not be able to interview them because we're not big enough for them or, you know, they're, <laughs> yeah. they're, I don't know, maybe we one day we'll get to anyone. In, yes. Maybe one day we will. But until we get to interview them, we can still learn from some of their interviews and stuff like that. So what we've done is we are going to choose an investor, most of the time an Australian investor, but let's not limit ourselves, uh, and play some of their quotes from some of their interviews that we've sort of picked out and clipped. And then we'll just have a chat about what they're saying. And it's a way to introduce ourselves and our listeners to some of these Australian investors that are worth knowing about and are worth learning from. Yeah, absolutely. Great idea. Very excited because, yeah, we don't know everyone. And, you know, even researching the guy that we're doing today found some things that I had no idea about. So I am pumped. So let's get stuck in. Uh, Yeah, that's a good segue. Why don't you tell us who we are studying today? So today we're going to be looking at a guy by the name of Kerr Nielsen, K-E-R-R-N-E-I-L-S-O-N for those who want to Google him. He is a, a Johannesburg native, but has been in Australia for, you know, over 30 years now and is one of the most respected and revered investors by not only um, his clients, but certainly his peers as well. Um, so to give you an idea of how successful he has been, he has a net worth of just under two billion Australian dollars. Uh, and that was as of 2016. So uh, I'm sure in the, the market that we've had over the last few years, then he would be worth a little bit more than that. So incredibly successful. I guess most notable, he is no, uh, he's most notable for uh, being the co-founder and CEO for quite a few a fair period of time of platinum asset management one of australia's arguably one of australia's best performing asset management uh, businesses but it didn't all start there for for care he um, as i said from south africa uh, came across to australia to work for the bankers trust australia which is now known as bt uh, bt funds management uh, and they were probably one of the biggest dogs back in in the 90s in terms of fund management. And Kerr, that's where uh, Kerr set up his um, position as, as uh, probably one of the best regarded investors because he famously positioned a lot of the clients at BT defensively prior to the 1987 uh, stock market crash in, in October. And that's where he got a lot of uh, pins and stripes against his reputation. So what I can that? keep... <laughs> He's got a lot, he had a lot of pins and stripes against his reputation. Is that a That's positive insane, or a negative? Positive, mate. I've never heard that saying before. <laughs> me either. You know me. I make these things <laughs> up. <laughs> wow. So, so, so Kerr is uh, he's known for his value-based stock picking, but quite contrarian in, in in the way he goes about his stocks. And and we'll go a bit deeper into this when we listen to some of his quotes. But you know, people compare him to the likes of Warren Buffett. Uh, and and that's the the style of uh, stock picking that he has trained him and his team at Platinum to to do. Just to give you an example of how uh, respected he is in the business, uh, when he moved from uh, BT Funds Management, the the first guy that sort of backed him in to start Platinum Asset Management was George Soros, who is another incredibly famous investor. Um, and from '94 through to to the late 2017. Their funds under management at Platinum Asset are now just under thirty billion, twenty-seven billion dollars. So, uh, he's had an incredible amount of success in in accumulating investors' money and also uh, investing it. So that's a very good uh, overview. Some good details about Kerr. A lot of people will have heard of Platinum Asset Management. If they haven't, they're one of Australia's biggest fund managers. They invest globally. Uh, They have a fund that looks at Asia specifically. They're an interesting, interesting company. So Mm. let's look at Kerr. We we have six clips that range from his views on what makes a good investor, where the opportunities are in the market at the moment. So um, unless you've got anything else to add, let's jump into the first clip. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Kerr, you've been a very successful investor over many years. What do you think the quintessential characteristics of a good investor are? I 
think it is to control your emotions. Emotions are what destroy good decision making. So what we discover in dealing with the public is um, they love the easy slogan. Mm. It sounds plausible. Mm. People must always eat. Mm. So we can buy food co companies with alacrity and certainty. What actually happens is there's one little difference and that is the price you pay. Mm. So firstly you've got to control your emotions and when things are down you want to say, well, surely everyone's mm. on that trade and now's the time to think about the other side. And when things are very high and continue to look perfect, you should start reining your own emotions in. Mm. But the second question is, how do you think about the investment versus the idea? Mm. And the most investors love the idea mm. and forget price. And I've failed to convey this to people so often because if I said to you, for example, go and buy a Porsche, you say, well, how much is my budget? And that would be the first question. You say, I could start with the bottom of the rung or something really exciting. But you'd ask about, what's my budget? Mm. They never, my experience is that private investor seldom talks about price. Mm. He thinks it's all about the idea. But if it's an idea that's fully priced, you're not going to make money. Mm. So those are the two things. Okay, so that's the first clip where Kerr talks about some of the things that make a good investor. The reason that I, I clipped that one was the the investment v the idea concept because, I mean, it, it seems logical, but a lot of people trip up on it, and I, I know I definitely trip up on it. You know, the idea can be right that uh, that company selling into China, uh, if they can get a a foothold in that market are going to make lots of money but if that investment idea is fully priced it might be a good invest it, sorry it might be a good idea but it's not a good investment yeah i completely agree uh, and i guess that's what he's you know most well known for is finding those stocks that are not fully priced i think for me what resonated most with this clip though was the first section where he was talking about controlling the emotions and people f loving um, the easy way um, and that that sort of becoming the emotion and and I think it's been one of the biggest learnings for me over the past few years is understanding how I emotionally react to the market and he even said that you know if you know if you don't control your emotions then it can have a, a massive negative impact on your returns and and flowing into what you were just saying, Ren, getting an understanding of investment versus idea, not falling in, in love with the idea and, and completely forgetting about the price, which I have certainly uh, succumbed to in the past. I guess my point, and, a, and a, maybe a quick comment from you, Ren, would be it's it's easy to say investment versus idea, but for a beginner investor, that's actually something that's quite hard to, to do is determine a, a price that you think yourself is sort of a fair value. So I guess do you have any comment on if you know someone who's just beginning has this idea of investment versus idea, how they can put it into practical action? Uh, I mean, it, it really just start, comes down to trial and error, I think. Uh, as you get more experience, you'll get better at determining what fair value is. I think probably one th important thing for beginners is that fair value is a concept. It's not a number. There's mm. no there's no perfect way to price a stock and there's no perfect way to determine what fair value is. Even the best investors will think about fair value as a range. So, you know, it's an imperfect science. Mm. It's important to think about it, but it shouldn't cripple your decision making. Yeah, I think almost finding the idea is the most important part for a beginner at this stage and and developing a thesis around ideas and and if the idea turns out to be right but the price wasn't quite there then you know you're on the right track whereas if the idea was wrong then you also know that you were not quite on the right track so yeah all right well let's get on to the second clip i would like now to spend some time on the research process behind platinum with a particular reference to the platinum international fund Care, can you explain the investment objectives of this fund? Well, we're really, in its simplest form, we're really just trying to give clients the opportunity to have a package of interesting companies. They're not necessarily the most popular companies because we feel they invariably are fully priced. What we're trying to do is find interesting companies which have defensible 
niches or positions in a market that for passing reasons, transient reasons, are not correctly priced. There's too much concern about very nearby events and people are overemphasizing those short-term factors in a company that's got a 50-year prospect or whatever. And that's where we try to add value by separating out the intrinsic value of the company from these these very noisy short-term news events and so on. So I really like this one, Ren. Well, I guess I like all of them, but um, <laughs> <laughs> this is this is uh, very Buffett to me. And you know, he talks about finding companies that are defensive in niches, uh, and that's just got Buffett written all over it. But it's a really good reminder as well for for me particularly to not sort of always look for the exciting, sexy companies. Um, to and you know, it, my vision can get quite narrow sometimes based on what the media is talking about and and it's you know you end up having just a select handful of stocks that you you're constantly looking at just based around hype or your own thesis or whatever and this was just a reminder for me you know there's a lot of solid companies out there that are consistently performing well uh, but aren't the latest you know fintech or retail bonanza you know there's the there's the companies that sell car parts and engineering services and that sort of stuff that equally performers as well and and do for the long term so it was a good reminder for me and also the you know separating the noise i'm sure you'll talk talk to that but that's for sort, for sort of my take on that yeah i no i think you summed it up really well I, I love this quote as well i think it really sums up what value investing is um or at least what the sort of warren buffett charlie munger style of value investing because there's there's one type of value investing where it's just find companies that can be that are trading less than what they can be liquidated for what they can be sold if they sell all the assets that's not what the buffett style is and that's not what kerr's talking about here what kerr's style of value investing is is finding companies that for whatever short-term reason are mispriced and are priced too low but are really defensible companies that over the long term will grow and getting them on the cheap so Mm. it's just a yeah, I think it really sums up, I, I guess, what we're trying to do. Well, definitely what I'm trying to do. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's a sort of proven strategy. Obviously, the the execution of it is the most difficult part, being able to determine what companies are trading below their intrinsic value and what companies are defensible and can grow over a long time. Yes. Uh, but if you are able to do those two things, you're probably set up very well. Yeah, agreed. Coming up with your own strategy to yeah, determine that that price is difficult, but you know there's a lot of things that you can do before that to sort of get you more than halfway for sure, um, which is which is encouraging. All right, number three. What most investors do, and most human beings, is if they've had a shock, they tend to overreact to it, and the same thing happens in stock markets when they've when they've been rewarded with something, they. Um, treat it as if it's uh, ongoing, and if they've um, been punished by something, they treat it as being um, the li- likewise. So there are two things that we do as humans. One well, that's very evident is we overemphasize a nearby event, which we call uh, a, you know, a selective bias, uh, so-called availability bias. And the second thing we do is we extrapolate. So if, we, if we're very happy at the moment, we tend to extrapolate that, that sense into the distant future, and if we're miserable, we tend to think that things are always going to be bad and so on. Those are the two things which we find in the human condition uh, very persistent and to our way of thinking, exploitable from a perspective of making money. All right, that was quote number three. I, I really like this one. I, I think um, it reminds me of our interview with Mir Statman. Yeah, definitely. Who, yeah, and uh, so he wrote a book about uh, cognitive biases and how that affects uh, traders and financial markets and it's similar to what Kerr's talking about here. But whereas Mia Statman was telling us we shouldn't try and invest because of our cognitive biases, what Kerr's saying here is he makes money by exploiting other mm. people's cognitive mm. biases. So I guess Kerr was the proverbial lion that Mia was yeah. warning us about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is great because you've got one of the best investors in Australia essentially giving you a, 
a, a pretty practical tip that if you can understand how markets react to shock, which he sort of started the quote there and and learn how to cut out noise and exploit these two human conditions, then you know, you're putting yourself in a pretty good position to respond to the way that others invest. And and as you're right, Ren, you you could be the lion smashing <laughs> the, the little fools on the other side. But yeah, I, I agree. I think um, there's not much more for me to add than than what you've just said. But understanding uh, the human human nature when it comes to the markets is certainly definitely very important. Yeah. All right. Uh, number four. Okay, you challenge the market when you buy an unloved stock. How do you manage this process when the market clearly believes you were wrong? Right. As Andrew said, it's all about the depth of work you're doing. So the essential thing is that when you're looking at your case, that you keep an open mind. And what we do is, uh, as we've said, is you write up a report. And in that report, it's very clearly stressed what we really are sure about and what we are unclear about. And there's, there's, there are milestones. And when you start seeing the milestones not being passed, that's a very early warning sign. And that's when you have to start reviewing whether you've actually got the right end of the stick or not. Because you're, you're quite right. That, that's the danger. And if you're stubborn for the sake of being proud, you lose money. And uh, as a serious investor, that's the real uh, mark of failure. It's not whether you made a little money or not. It's, it's how much money have you lost on your supposed great insight. And um, we, we are very clear that we're not talking about absolute, uh, relative returns. We're talking about how much money have you made. And that's what ma- matters, not relative returns. Uh, Ren, I've got three quick points for this one. Uh, the first is that uh, he's, I think he's saying that ego can, t- can kill your returns. That must be tough for you then. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's happened to me, you know. You have that stock that you just hold on to. You know, you thought it was going to be a winner and, and anyway, you end up losing money on it. Uh, keeping an open mind, you know, the research that I was doing on Care Before the show, all of his peers speak about one of his greatest assets was his ability to keep an open mind when looking at all these sorts of investments and cut the noise out. So I think that's a really important point to understand and try and put into practice when coming up with an investing thesis. And But also I took away from that is, you know, don't be complacent, especially if you are doing individual stock picks. A bit, a bit different if you're investing in the index and that sort of stuff, but you can be burnt if you become complacent and don't react to changes that go against uh, the original reason that you invested in stocks and, and, you know, don't let your ego get in the way of that. Otherwise, you could really get burnt. Yeah, nice. I think they're all all good takeaways. Um, the only thing I'd add to that was when he talked about they write a report and they have milestones and then if the company doesn't hit those milestones, then they realize that they're wrong and they, you know, start to sell their position. I think it's very easy to become quite connected to the stocks that you've chosen and then to you know look at them with rose-colored glasses I guess to not see the problems that are arising so if yeah. you if you're very clear about what you expect to happen and in your thesis and while you're buying the company and then you're you're watching to see if the thesis is confirmed and if it's not it, it's good to have some objective ways to measure that it's not happening you know whether it is growth in sales in a particular market, whether it is the success of a new product line, whether it is you know, X, Y, or Z, whatever it is, if you have some clear milestones or some clear objective standards by which you can judge your thesis, it's a good way to take the emotional bias out of it, which is uh, always, you know, always a positive. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we've got two to go. Let's crack into number five. Looking around corners, you know, again, avoiding this extrapolation because many people are good at describing a company, but they don't understand its workings. What really makes this company different? What really protects it? Because there's a slogan around a brand, but it doesn't give you an insight into what really allows it to make these very high rents. All right, um, that's a really, really quick one there, but I think uh, I think it's a good summation of the idea of a moat and finding 
companies that have some way to protect their brand. And that's what he talks about when he says understanding the reason that a company can charge high rents. So, you know, as he says, you've got you to under, really understand the company and understand what makes it different and what makes it defensible. Um, it's all good and well just to be able to describe a company, but really what we as investors make money on is companies that have the ability to raise their price uh, to attract more customers without their competitors eating into their margin or taking away market share. Mm. Um, so that's that's the idea of a moat, and that's what that's what Kerr's talking about here. And that's I mean that's the sort of the golden thing that Absolutely. we look for, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, we all love a good moat. And just to plug you, Ren, you wrote a really good uh, blog post on moats. So head over to our website and check it out. <laughs> yeah. I don't really have anything much more to add to that. So uh, let's move on. All right. Last one. Here we go. Okay. So let's talk about some of the investments you've made mm-hmm. recently. Um, some of the additions you've made are mm-hmm. Coca Cola and McDonald's, right. both household names, mm-hmm. global mega caps. Uh, and, and it's interesting, how do, how do these companies which make burgers and, and beverages, how, how are they a good hedge in this low rate, low interest rate world? Well that's an interesting example because those aren't the sort of companies we'd normally buy because they're big names and typically get fully priced. A couple of things those companies have done that has damaged their reputations, not only from what they supply but the way they supply them, so that their prices were discounting a lot of uncertainty and that gave us an opportunity to buy what are really quite long-term investments uh, at a very modest price. Um, but that is unusual. Most of the time when you have big names like that, they, they become overpriced rather than underpriced. Yeah, and so with this one, I think the main takeaway for me, and this is something we talk about on the show, you know, he's, he's talking about the big blue chip mega cap stocks here. And, you know, we, we, we say that if you want to sort of double your money, it's very hard to do that with these sorts of companies. Um, but it, but I think the main takeaway for me is that if you do follow them and sort of get a, aware of their price behavior and and understand that when these companies do take a hit, that it's a, a substantial one where you, you know, you can then take that opportunity to invest, then uh, you can still make a bit of money, but usually they're very well fully priced and, and pay a decent dividend. But I guess something that comes to mind would be Woolworths, for example, um, hasn't really moved a lot over the past sort of two or three years. Uh, but, you know, six or seven years ago, it had fallen significantly. And if you'd got in at that time, um, you would have done reasonably well. But over the last sort of couple of years, it's remained fairly stable just because of the size and, and nature of the stock. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to comment on Worths because uh, I think <laughs> good. I think it's got further to fall, really. Oh. Uh, um, but I think th- this quote is a, a nice callback to um, the second quote where Kerr talked about looking for long-term value um, with companies with the companies that have defensible positions, but they have short-term reasons to be underpriced, and both McDonald's and Coke. He was saying, you know, because of a bunch of reasons, are uh, underpriced in the short term, but as a long-term business, are still, you know, extremely strong, um, have extremely defensible positions in their markets or well, markets around the world, and so this is an opportunity to uh, buy a defensible long-term stock at a relatively good price. Very Buffett as well. That's a very Buffett thing to do. Yes. Yes. Now, nice one, Ren. That's yeah. the end of the quotes, and uh, we should end the episode by saying if uh, Kerr or anyone from Platinum is listening, you can, rather than us playing clips of you guys, you can actually come <laughs> and chat to us if you want. Yeah, so that's going to be our challenge. Yeah. If anyone out there knows Kerr, <laughs> <laughs> let us know. Uh, Ren, I, I also want to just finish with, by saying that a lot of the concepts that we've discussed here today and that Care has spoken about are quite advanced. And if you're listening to them for the first time as a beginner, well, obviously, welcome to the show. And, you know, there's no uh, way that you would be able to put into practice a whole bunch of the things that um, Care has been talking about. But um, there were some great uh, practical tips that you can start thinking about. And this is just a great way to start framing 
your idea of thinking if you wanted to go down the value path and to give you a bit of insight into the way some of these really good investors go about their business and to help you sort of start researching some of the the ways in which they do it. So don't be overwhelmed by some of the things that have been said, um, but definitely do some further research because obviously what they say is uh, paying massive dividends. I think he took home $42 million in dividends last year. Yeah, so Literally <laughs> massive dividends. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so look, if you enjoyed the episode and uh, you have an investor that you want us to sort of do this for, uh, hit us up, let us know. And other than that, I think that until next time. Yeah, talk yeah, soon. We, uh, we didn't keep it under 20 minutes, I've got to say. Yeah, thanks for reminding <laughs> me. <laughs> Equity mates and the people appearing in this program may have positions in the companies mentioned. This is general advice only. Please speak to a financial professional to understand how it may pertain to your individual situation.